Tips. Hi, I'm Lise Wheel. I'll be with you for the next two hours. We have breaking news today. You know we've been all waiting and watching this case. Iowa versus Zachary Kean. We have a verdict, folks. We have a verdict in Iowa versus Zachary Kean. We don't have a feed yet on the case. So when we do, we will be bringing you that verdict. We don't have it in yet. We don't have the feed to bring it to you. We are watching it. Look. We can see it there. You're watching it right with us. We can see it. We're watching it. We've got eyes and ears on it. We will bring it to you as soon as we have it and as soon as you can hear it, as soon as you can hear it and we can hear it. And we will be there and have it for you, okay? But we have a verdict, breaking news. We will be getting a verdict in on the Iowa versus Zachary Kean case. We've been all following this case. We know this case. Baby Sterling case, sad case, dramatic case, dramatic testimony that we've been watching over the last many days. Uh, I can tell you here at Long Crime, there have been, you know, uh, many, many tears shed uh, over this case. And now we are going to have uh, a witness uh, a verdict read. Um, we're going to go to some uh, witness prep here. Um, in uh, some of the other cases, we're going to have um, some rundown here. Uh, so let's go to that in Kean Witness Prep. Let's go to that. Now, criminal cases are very dramatic, but probably the most dramatic evidence that you can have, the most dramatic testimony you can have, is when the defendant, him or herself, takes the stand. And we have that here, folks, as you know, in the Zachary Kean case. We had Zachary Kean take the stand. Let's listen in to the defendant, Zachary Kean, when he took the stand. As dramatic as that is, it's more dramatic as what's going on in the courtroom right now. Let's go live into the courtroom in the Kean case. All right, you heard it here. It's guilty, first degree murder, guilty, child endangerment, death of a child. That's guilty on both counts. Guilty, first degree murder, guilty, child endangerment of de death of a child. So uh, he is guilty on the defendant here is guilty on both counts that the prosecution brought. Uh, pretty much he didn't say anything in response to that. Uh, the case against him was very, very strong. Those of you who've been following this case recall the testimony of the first responders, the stench. In the, uh, in the around baby Sterling, uh, his toes were crusted over. Um, the baby was still in the uh, swing. The first responder, one of them talked about how the swing set, uh, the swing he had, uh, there's baby Sterling there. Uh, the swing was the same model that uh, the first responder had his own child in. And he talked about how he could barely, uh, the, 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 the baby Sterling couldn't even be taken out of the baby of the swing set. Uh, the, the toes were so crusted over. The stench, the stench was so overwhelming. Uh, how the uh, how the couple had used some air freshener to try to cover up the urine smell. Of course, that all went to sort of premeditation and knowledge and consciousness of guilt. All of the things that I'm that I am assuming here, a pretty good guess that the jury must have taken into consideration in coming up with these two guilty verdicts. Again, guilty, murder, first degree, folks, first degree, uh, and then guilty of the lesser, uh, which is child endangerment, which resulted in the death of a child. Now, that second degree, that second charge would, of course, been the lesser charge, easier to prove, but the guilty first degree, uh, which some folks here in long crime said, well, that's, a, you know, more of a stretch, harder to prove, have to show, you know, that there's an intent, all of that. That's all the things, all the things I was just talking about when I said the air freshener, all of that. That's what the prosecution was getting at when they were talking about all of those details. When they talked about that, that's where they got at when they, when they went into that first degree charge. And that's where the jury came back at with that first degree murder charge. So guilty on both of those. Let's go back right now here and replay just a little bit more of the defense and the defendant on the stand. We'll be back with more analysis in just a moment. 
Okay, Michael, Brian, you were here with me last week. We were talking about this case, and now we have the verdict. That's crazy. I mean, just such an emotional case. Yep. Uh, you know, any parent who hears the details of this case, they, they cringe, you know. Uh, they oh don't want to hear the details. No. It is so gruesome. Were you surprised by the verdict? Not really. Uh, I think this is a case in which the jury wants to find what they need to find him guilty of the top charge, and they did that. Right. Uh, this was not a very successful defense of blame the mom. You know, it, it, it never goes very well, and in this case, even if the mom was somewhat uh, culpable, and I guess we'll find out in the right. trial to come, right. uh, was he reasonable in relying on just shunting it off to her, knowing she had perhaps uh, substance abuse issues, knowing perhaps that she couldn't take care of the child either? You can't just wash your hands of it and say, hey, you know, it wasn't my job. Not when we have all of these facts that we I just alluded to just a few minutes ago with the, the you know how, how long baby sterling was in that in the baby in the in the swing there and how long he was there it's and unimaginable how, i mean really, really i felt sorry is. for the jury because had to they to these, had to not just listen they had to see photos right. that, that you and we i were could come in and out of part. quickly right yes uh and, and it's just uh you know you don't need to see that in your no, life ever no, ever and 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 so you know I, I I'm not surprised by the verdict either. Um, again, you and I could just come in and out of it very quickly. They had to sit there day after day and listen to this. And I was really taken aback by the reaction of those first responders, not just the one I mentioned with the baby carriage, but but the baby swing, but all of the others. There were there were a bunch of them. A couple of them moved almost to tears on the stand. Yeah. These are. Kind of These are hardened near, folks. I, I was going to yeah, say, I mean, you, you know, used the word hardened, well, but know, I was going to use it as well. You get desensitized to these things. A if that's bit. your job day in, day out, but there's always something that comes along that even you, as somebody in the trenches every day, is going to be like, whoa. Whoa, that's, right. That, I, I, I'm not sure I signed up for this. You know? Right, right. And this case would be certainly that. Um, so let's go to a quick break. This has been a lot of news to just kind of digest and process. So we'll go to break, and we'll come back, and we'll do more analysis and... Uh, more of this uh, to come after break. We'll be right back. All right, Michael, you know we've been following the Wilburn case all morning, and we, ha we did have a sentencing on that, but the defendant was not actually in uh, at, at... He had a little... How should we say? A little outburst? Yes. A little anger management <laughs> issue? Yeah, look, mm -hmm. I, you know what? I love it when I have a guest who kind of comes in and just says a little bit better than I do. A little anger management issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. He needed I like a timeout. So, you know what? Again, yeah. a little timeout. You know, I, I used to give myself timeouts when I was like, you know what? I need a little timeout. I'm going to sort of walk to the mailbox and back. So he <laughs> needed a little bit of timeout. Anyway, so um, he was sentenced. But he now was he was not in the room. So now what happens when they're not actually there for their sentencing? They have to actually hear their sentence, of course, right? He was represented. Constitutionally. Of course. But, but that's not good enough. He's represented. Okay, that's fine. For the reading of the decision. For the decision. reading of the decision. And that's good enough for all of us here, because we like to hear it. But that's not actually good enough for the Constitution. Of course. He's going to be read the... Uh the result by the judge on the record just so that he hears it and acknowledges it. It's not like he personally is going to do anything as a result, although from what we've seen, maybe he would do something. Oh, crazy. oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Um, right. But, but, but generally, no. I mean, he, he's going to hear it as he should hear it, and the fact that he was not there when it was read the first time is not that big a deal. No, it's not that big a deal, but explain why, why it is important under our Constitution for the defendant to have the right. It's obviously, you know, it's for the preliminary hearing, for bail sentencing, obviously, but also for things like being able to to uh, confront your accuser, sure. to confront the witnesses, and now to be able, at the final stage, to be able to, even though I'm sure he has probably heard, through a little bit of chatter, if you will, what the sentence is, to be able to hear from the judge yeah. what the sentence well, is. Well, we're talking about the, the practical difference versus the, you know, the, the legal theoretical right. difference. Practically speaking, no real impact. No real difference. But legally, constitutionally, he has a right to be present at all proceedings that involve him and the charges against him. So yes, he had that constitutional right to be there. Now, the judge decided, based on his prior outbursts, that uh, you know we're, we're going to do this without him here because he's he's had some outbursts when less impactful things have happened in that court. The judge is probably being just a little cautious, saying you know if this guy gets life without parole or death, 
there might be a, a greater outburst, and maybe that is a safety issue for others in the courtroom. Well, that's what I was just going to say. The, the judge has to balance both the rights of the defendant, as it is in all sorts of levels of the courtroom, the de rights of the defendant with the rights and responsibilities that the judge has to all of us in the courtroom as far as witnesses go and jurors and everybody else in the courtroom. And you see this when the right to confrontation of a, of a witness, for example. Um, sometimes the witness, it's happened where the witness is shrouded, where the witness is in a bubble. Um, you know, you put the bubble over the, I don't mean actual in a bubble, but you know, you, you, the cone you, you, know, you know, the cone of silence yes, kind yes, of thing. Protect their identity, um, sure. To do that, there, you have to be able to protect a witness. Um, you have to be able to protect jurors. You have to be able to sequester jurors sometimes be, for their protection. And so this is just one more example where the judge is trying to be able to, you know, make sure that there's order in the courtroom and that the defendant is also given his rights. Right. And if you're a defense counsel, that's maybe just another item you throw in the appeal, that he was somehow violated, that uh, his right was violated on that grounds. Good it's luck not a winner. on that one. It's not going to win the day. But if you're throwing a lot of stuff against the wall, you, you're going to throw that in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You defense lawyers. Hey, hey, you know, just zealously representing clients. Yeah, you in the in the in the kitchen sink. You yeah. know, I mean, I don't know. You guys, you guys, this is kitchen sink, and you defense lawyers. <laughs> do you guys go home and you have like the spaghetti, and you just like try throwing a lot of stuff, and you just yes. like, keep yeah. Yes. And you just like keep I think all attorneys marinara, do that. I don't think it's just it. defense attorneys. I think no, we prosecutor former prosecutors. Folks. We never did that. No. Never. Oh, never. No, no, no. And it never happens in the civil world either because oh, it's civil. civil. Civil world's the worst. You guys are the, the civil world's the worst. The civil world's they're the most uncivil in civil court. Let's go, let's go to trial right now and see what's going on. Here we go. Let's see. Well, this judge is thanking the jury for their patience and their time. Uh, is also thanking both sides, both the defense counsel and the prosecution and panning to the victims family, uh, really looking at them and, and really sort of greeting with them. And also, he is done, really, with uh, Michael, wouldn't you say? He's pretty much done uh, with this, Mr. Wilburn. I'm sure he's had He's some, had it with him. And he's done a great job. He really Th This has. judge has been so professional. Very and he, he commented uh, on the professionalism of the lawyers in this case and pretty much said, you know, I'm pretty much done with this defendant. He'll come back when I say he's going to come back. And I think said December 8th. Come back for this resentencing, and it, you know he will be told. He will be here when I tell him. Yeah, they'll here. subdue him. However, they'll subdue him. He'll they just don't bring him gag here. him exactly, but no, if, if he they will bring him continue here. to scream out, and they'll handle him. Yeah, yeah, they'll bring him. But the judge is busy. He's got other things to do. He really spent time uh, looking at the family, looking at the victims, looking at these jurors, and thanking them, and really talking about um, the victim here, and 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 going on and leaving it at that. Um, and we'll leave it at that for now. Go to break, and we'll be back on the other side of the break. All right, let's go straight back. We've been concentrating on the Wilburn sentencing, so let's go straight back in to hear that live. Sorry, we've heard it live. Let's go straight back in to hear that again. Life without possibility of parole. All right. He was spared the death penalty for the murder of a Memphis police officer. That is the verdict for Tremon Wilburn. Uh, you just heard it there from the judge. Uh, Mr. Wilburn was not there to receive the sentence. Uh, we'll hear more about that um, later on, but he was not there to receive the sentence. He was, uh, was in an agitated state and had to be removed from the courtroom. There are other people that were in agitated states and were in the courtroom and were testifying. Let's hear um, from one of the officers um, talking about uh, the impact, though, that this uh, murder had on him. All right, let's come out of this for a second. You see here on the other side of the other screen here, that is a presser for the Wilburn case. We want to hear what's going on. Now, this is actually live, so let's hear what this is going, what's happening. A press in the Wilburn case. Let's hear it. All right, there you heard it. The prosecutors in the Wilburn case, they're talking about how Wilburn expressed no remorse, uh, how the family wanted the jury to decide this. 
how they weren't pressing for the death penalty, Michael. They just wanted the jury to decide it, how they wanted really to send a message pretty much in this case that what you do to one police officer, you do to all law enforcement. I thought that was very, very powerful. And what you saw here with the way that he, Wilburn, was reacting uh, and, as you said, anger management issues in hearing his sentence, um, they, the family of, of, of the fallen police officer, they wanted the jury to see that because that is how, they, you know, they wanted him, they wanted the jury to make the decision. Oh, sure. Here. And they got an ear and eyeful during the course yes. of the trial. He was not shy. Uh, to say he was not remorseful is oh. the biggest understatement ever. Yes. And the jury saw what they had in front of them. Remember, they had the option of life with the possibility of parole, but right. I took that right off my, my, my that sheet was off. immediately. Right. And I'm actually a little surprised that he did not get the death penalty because he aggravated the jury so much during the course of his trial. If you add that to the facts as they were laid out, which were pretty convincing, I mean, a cop killer, uh, truly a cold-blooded killing. This cop pulls over a car that's parked illegally, pulls over to check on that right, car. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, it tells you how difficult that job is. You know, you, this this looks Just like the most doing, innocent right. of, of incidents from, from his perspective. He pulls over cars parked illegally. So and what? he ends up getting shot eight times in the right. face, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it was horrible. So I really felt that the jury might, you know, decide this guy deserves at least as bad a fate as he dished out. Right. Uh, and we, we believe the jury was death qualified. That's, uh, that's generally that's the way it, it works right. before right. they get to sit down. Right. But they decided to spare his life. Right, right. Um, so, look, I, I, what we got from this presser, though, was that the, uh, this victim's family was not, you know, sometimes we think that the victim's family is behind the prosecutor pushing them for the death penalty, and that's the only reason that the prosecutor goes for the death penalty. Not at all here. I mean, what we got from this, from this presser is the prosecutor saying, no, I mean, that this, this family, all they wanted is for the jury to take a look at this and for the jury to decide. And what I thought was so key, to my ear anyway, is that the prosecutor said, they just wanted the jury to make the decision. Well, I love that you know, to hear that. It let me play the other them. side of that argument, and that is this, that you have a family that probably wishes the worst for this guy, but they're not publicly going to say that. They're not going to say, you know, with pitchforks uh, and run them out of town. They, on the that they them. could. They could have, but they didn't. to what end? To what end? I mean, oh, to get people riled up, I, I to get suppose. the whole community. But they didn't, though, Michael. I, I think, think that takes a lot of something palatable for them as a as a, a grieving family to say, look. They didn't have to make the decision, and, and I'm glad I didn't have to make the decision to decide whether somebody lives or dies. But but to put it on somebody else is so, somewhat comforting. You know, you, I think you don't so. have to deal with it. Right. Whatever they decide, that's fine with me. I I think that takes so, though something for that family to be able to say that that I'm putting it. I want the jury to decide. I want the jury system to work. It's what you decide. It's 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 your decision. I'm leaving it to you to decide. It's in your hands. And, and yet we do know you. there was an attempt at a plea deal that the families apparently said we're not comfortable with that. I don't know the details of that plea deal, but it was rejected by the families, so they wanted the jury to the jury impose to what they felt was necessary. And and that is what happened. And apparently the prosecutors say that the jury is that, that sorry the victim's family is very happy with this, this decision and that this is all that they wanted is for the jury to hear it and to get their day in court. And the judge was very clear, and you and I commented about this, when he made those, that last statement and you know, said that Wilburn will be here on December 8th or whatever, actually, that he looked right at the victim's family and said, you know, it's been so long for you, and maybe this will be some kind of closure. Of course, it won't bring him back, but it'll be some kind of closure for you. And he really commented about how, how brave they've been and really looked right at them and, and spoke to those victims' families. Yeah, and this is going to be one more chance for them to be in the room with the guy, for better or worse, because right. he's going to be sentenced on those lesser charges, which is irrelevant. It, really, it doesn't yeah. matter. You can't be but locked up one way up or the other, he's going to be in that room. Right? Yeah. Wow. All right, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back for more. All right, we're back with the Wilburn case, and you know, we just have the sentencing. There were so many interesting issues in this trial, and of course, now that's what we get to do since we've had the sentencing, is we go back and we get to analyze, we get to do that here in, in Law and Crime. Um, one of the really interesting issues, it seems to me, was that whole issue about whether or not this Dr. Turner would be able to testify. Now, you remember him. He was the doctor who was going to testify, testify about race-based trauma. He was a race-based trauma expert. 
Let's listen in to that testimony about whether or not he could testify. Okay, so uh, let's go to more of a clip on this now. When I said expert just a moment ago, I kind of set myself up because that's the whole debate of whether or not this is an actual field of expertise and whether or not Dr. Turner is an expert in racial trauma testimony and whether or not this is an expert, an area to be an expert in. So let's listen, with that caveat, let's listen into more. Okay. Um, the judge then goes on to question, the, to question this Dr. Turner. And it's all about this race-based trauma um, testimony, uh, racial trauma testimony. And it's all about PTSD that Mr. Wilburn may or may not have suffered and whether or not that would have caused him um, to react in a certain way. What is your opinion so far? I'm questioning you like you're an expert. Yes. What is it? Well, you are, you are an expert. You are our trial expert. But first of all, let's set up the standard just a little bit. Sure. Where, what, what is being done right here now in the courtroom? This is really no different than somebody who tries to offer, as we all know, the lie detector testimony slash evidence. It's been right. decided many, many times over that it's not reliable. That science is not reliable. This is no different. This is a clinical psychologist suggesting that he has evidence to suggest that race-based bias exists and causes stress, and in this case, in the, uh, in, the, in the upbringing and in the history of the defendant. But what you have to prove to get that in is right. that it is an accepted science within the reasonable uh, scientific community. Also and known as? Also known as? Well, using the Fry standard. Oh, yeah, the, the Kelly Fry the standard. Kelly Fry standard. Kelly, standard. Kelly across the country, right. they throw in Fry in California. Right, I'm not, right, they had a right. good case there. But, there, but it's, it's a, it's a well-known standard. It's a legal standard that lawyers yes. have to use to so jump to the standard. So you can't throw just throw it out there. It up there. I've right always there. had this issue with the DNA. We've got, I'm not the DNA, the cell phone testimony. Right. We've gotten into this before. Right. Uh, I don't know that that's been established as proper scientific right. evidence. Right. But, but anyway, the, the there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a hurdle that we have to cross. And this is a tough one. To me. You know, this is not to say that those of of any certain race are not stressed to some degree. That's not the standard. Right. The standard is, stressed. is it accepted right. within the scientific community? Right. And the, the judge made it very clear that uh, no, it's right. not. Right, okay. So you're not gonna testify uh, on the defendant's behalf. Well, and what happened, yeah, and what happened here is that this, this particular uh, doctor was not qualified to be an expert and therefore his testimony just didn't come in. And I'm not sure if he even got as far as this doctor in particular, right. as opposed as to the science. science as a whole. Exactly, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah, so this, sorry. Guy, this guy may this be guy's the great. best, he might be the best race-based right. stress guy in the world. It's just that that science. Don't matter. I don't exactly. Care. Is yeah. not qualified. as, And it may be a science out in the schools, for example, but it's not a science it's, it hasn't met the fry test. I'm exactly. just going to put it that and, way. And so it's a real in the thing. Sure it's it might a real be a real thing. thing in but the, that's not the standard. It's not the standard. Hasn't met the, that acceptability to meet it in the court. And, a lot and of that's, that's what we're talking about. A lot about. of that's because when we cloak somebody with that expertise, then the jury is like, ooh, that person's exactly. an expert. And whatever they say must be correct. Well, they're we not going to cloak that expert with that right. kind of uh, power. May I even give you the, the additional example of in the jury instructions? When we give out jury, when the judge gives out jury instructions, it's not with me. When the judge gives out jury instructions, he gives out a special jury instructions for experts, and because we do, as you say, cloak experts with that special aura of whatever they say must be right. That's what we talk about dueling experts. You know, one side gets one, one gets gets the other, so that you you blank each other out, cross each other out. Because we do lend so much credibility to what our experts say. Of course. Say. And remember, the expert is supposed to be there to help the jury, right. too. It's supposed right. to be things that it, only an expert could understand. Right. Now, it's possible on a lower level, most people would understand that certain races have been treated differently Absolutely. throughout time and Absolutely. place. Absolutely. 100%. So uh, where's the science? It's got to go but a lot further science. than that. science. Right. Exactly. We may all agree with what Dr. Turner just said there on the stand, 100%. But does it meet that, I'm going to use the Fry test, does it meet that acceptability standard of in the law? And it just didn't here in this case. Nope. And that judge didn't let it in. All right. Thank you so much. We'll be going to a break, and we'll be right back after the other side of the break with more analysis. Stay with us.
Welcome back. All right, it's the top of the hour, which means top crimes. Let's see what's up. Today's top crime story is trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. The young driver accused of striking and killing three Girl Scouts and a mother in Wisconsin was reportedly inhaling chemical vapors, also known as huffing, prior to the fatal collision. 21-year-old Colton True was arrested after striking the victims with his pickup truck and fleeing the scene of the deadly accident in Lake Halley. True later surrendered to authorities and reportedly admitted to huffing chemical vapors before crashing his Ford F-150 into a roadside ditch where the victims were performing a community service project. True now faces 13 charges, including four counts of intoxicated use of a motor vehicle. Christopher Watts, the Colorado man accused of killing his pregnant wife and two daughters, had his next court date moved up by two weeks by prosecutors in Colorado. Watts now faces multiple felony charges, including three counts of first-degree murder and one count of first-degree unlawful termination of a pregnancy. A North Carolina woman dubbed South Park Susan after she was caught on camera in the middle of a racist rant to two black women as they waited for AAA service, was arrested for making two calls to 911 deemed a misuse of the emergency line system. 51-year-old Susan Westwood turned herself into police in connection with the October 19th incident. Nobody cares. I'm white and I'm hot. I'm white and I'm hot. Westwood was fired from her job at Charter Communications and now faces criminal charges. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. Ooh, lady, you really need some help. <laughs> oh, um, okay, we're back. Oh, oh. Okay, let's, uh, enough of top crimes there, or a little editorial commenting there on that. Lady needs a little bit of help there, Michael, but anyway. Um, let's see. Let's go to Wilbur and his outburst. But he had another, that, that, anyway. I was going to make another comment, but we better just go to Wilbur and his outburst. Well, that Mr. Wilburn certainly had a uh, outburst there, anger management issues, as you said. You know, the judge said more than once that uh, he likes to control things. He likes to take charge. And, you know, it's tough when the judge sees that. He's right. the guy in charge, the judge. The judge is now. He wanted a uh, mistrial out of that. Uh, maybe the uh, the outburst was just intended only for a mistrial and was all intended on uh, Wilburn's part, Machiavellian uh, attempt. But the judge denied the mistrial. Denied. Yes, yeah. denied. This judge is absolutely in control. We just saw a presser just a few minutes ago uh, with the prosecution. And the prosecution, you know, it's just so clear that the prosecution, that they had their case put together, and the judge allowed them to put their case on. I mean, this judge was absolutely in control on the whole time, and in control even when Wilburn was acting up like this. Yeah. And, and when I he denied so much... this motion for mistrial, it was well uh, uh, stated for the yep. record, which yep. is important. Which is really and, important. And that is, and I just mentioned a zealous representation, he basically said uh, an attorney can zealously represent in an oral argument, in a closing argument, and do what this prosecutor did. I'm yes. sorry if Mr. Wilburn got Doesn't a little like it. touchy and uh, you know didn't like it and spouted off and cursed. Too bad. Too bad. That's not enough for a mistrial. Right. We may be saying not, not nice things about you, about you, Mr. Wilburn, that you don't like to hear, but that's no, you know, you can't be doing that, and it's not cause for a mistrial here. I, I just really thought this judge was terrific yeah. in this case. Yeah. And, and that'll uh, be so, another uh, yeah. notion on the appeal. Yeah, well, well. Let's, let's, let's put that on the list. Speaking of this judge, let's go to the judge on the mistrial issue. Mr. Wilborn involuntarily removed himself. So, you know, I was going to be voluntarily removed himself. He chose to remove himself. Yeah, the judge he covered himself to do both it. ways here. First, he said not only did Mr. Wilborn ask right. to be excused, right. but he then, the judge then whipped open his uh, he, he book had of the criminal rules. procedure right. and said he also violated 43V2, yep, yep, yep. meaning he was, uh, you know, outrageous yep. conduct, uh, violent repugnant. conduct. <laughs> repugnant. Yeah, I, love I don't that know word. if repugnant was his or the code. I think that was his yeah. word before uh, I got into the rule book. I noted that. So he covered both ways that right. this defendant was not there, voluntarily and involuntarily right. under the code. Right, right, good, right. Good no, job. no, it was great, but that, that re re repugnant was his word. Yes. Um, I think this judge is just about headed up to here with this defendant. Yeah, he did a great job. I'm sure he's not sad that it's over. No, no. Uh, this was, a, yeah, this is a terrific job by this judge. Um, and, and just going through everything and I and, and, and covering all of his bases in an appeal 
Um, let's go now, though, to the sentencing um, after the mistrial motion. All right, life without the possibility of parole. That is the sentence for Mr. Wilborn. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. We've been talking about the Wilburn sentencing uh, really for the last hour and a half. It's just been so fascinating going back and forth with the prosecution, with the judge, with Wilburn's uh, antics, shall we say, or his anger management, as my lovely guest has, has put it so well. Um, let's go now, though, to back just a little bit to when the sentencing was really underway and he was trying to come up with some kind of mitigation really to spare his life. And the person they put on the stand, first and foremost, or foremost at least, was a mitigation expert. Um, and let's put her on the stand. Lori Hall was her name. Let's, let's listen to what she had to say. Okay, Ms. Hall is the mitigation expert. She is trying to save Wilburn's life. Uh, let's see if she's doing a good job so far. Let's listen and see what else she does. All right, we have breaking news. We have Chris Watts in Colorado. He has reached a plea deal in a murder case. He's that is going to avoid a death penalty. Uh, death penalty. This is out of Greeley, Colorado. Now, again, remember this case. We just covered it just a few moments ago in our top crimes. This is the case where he was accused of killing his wife, Shannon, and their two young daughters, Bella and Celeste. Uh, Shannon was pregnant with their third child. The boy, there he is right there. Uh, Watts has reached a plea deal this afternoon in order to avoid the death penalty. That's what we know. That's what's breaking right now, just this moment into law and crime. He has been in custody, we know that, in Well County since the murders in August. So that is breaking right now. Michael, we have this coming in right now to us that he's, a, he's avoiding the death penalty by taking the plea deal. Uh, tragic case. Horrible, his horrible. wife, his, his pregnant wife. I'm looking at pictures now That's of just, little girls. It, you look at this family. I mean, this looks like the perfect family. Perfect family. family. You know? um, investigators say that Watts killed his family, then dumped their bodies in a property uh, belonging to an oil company. I mean, this looks like it was premeditated, hence the death penalty. Watts had worked for the company um, when the allegations arose. Um, the girls' bodies, I mean, there are the girls' pictures of the girls' bodies, or the girls there, the body, but the bodies were found in oil barrels, um, and Shannon's body was found in a shallow grave nearby. Look at this family now, and then, of course, um, hearing the details about how their bodies were found. So all the bodies were found, the bodies were recovered, so we don't have anything of, of you know, missing bodies. We, all the bodies were recovered, but they were recovered near where uh, uh, Watts worked or had worked at the time back in August. The family autopsy records were never released um, so we don't know the re the uh, reports or the autopsy reports uh, they were never released and um, and uh, but a judge did we found out did we uh, did deny a request to seal them so that means that we will at some point get those autops autopsy reports but we don't have them yet that's all probably per the workings again of the plea deal which just breaking news right now we can confirm that Watts has signed a plea deal uh, to avoid the death penalty in Colorado. Let's go to a quick break, Michael. We'll be back with more analysis on the other side of that break. All right, let's go back now to more of that Wilburn sentencing. He did not receive the death penalty, Michael. And you and I discussed, I think that may have been due to one Miss Lori Hall on the stand. You know, I wouldn't... I think it's overstating what she did. She saved his life. You remember the it's standard. The mitigation specialist yes. was just on the stand. She was basically ago. saying, "Here's why he has had it rough, and why his life may have led to this right. ultimate horrible event." But the jury has to find beyond a reasonable doubt right. that the aggravating factors right. override the mitigating factors. Right. Now we don't know what's in their minds. We don't know how that all and shakes that out. Recipe, exactly. Right. What's in the bouillon bays there? But the fact is, she gave them she something. Fancy. Bouillon bays. Right, some well, cold soup of some soup, sort. But whatever. She gave them enough. <laughs> right. It seems to find that you know, yeah, the aggravation was horrible here, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. Um, but the kid had it tough, and kid we're going to give we're giving him a break. 
Right. I mean, it showed all the pictures. It showed how the mom was out. I mean, it was pretty horrible. The mom was out partying. The mom gave him up at age 10 and just basically said, Said, hey, I'm hey, an adult. Kid. I can do what I want. Uh, you know, Go the away, whole... kid. And, and you saw the family photo. This kid had lots of right. siblings. Okay. Now, I'm going to be mean old prosecutor me that I'm, I'm so, you know, prosecutor Go ahead. Me. Take a shot. Yeah. And I'm going to say, okay, lots of kids have lots of siblings and have hard, mean old moms. And they don't grow up and kill cops and shoot them in the face. I mean, I'm sorry. They don't. They grow up and they, they get to be nice people. Yeah, and that might have worked on, I know, six, six of the jurors, seven, eight, you know, but this had to be a unanimous right. decision. Right. And who knows what bargaining might have gone on in the right. jury room. But that argument, I'm sure, w was being batted about in that jury room. Exactly. Hey, come on, you know, my kid didn't my have kid it. Didn't, the, you yeah, know, I, 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 I had a tough, tough life. Yeah, 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 you know, I had to walk to school, to walk you know, to school. uphill both ways right, no, in the but, snow. Yeah, but yeah. even seriously, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, I... Every, you know, my trainings weren't prosecuted. I mean, all, all the pre-sentence reports, it seemed like a tough child, a tough child. But, yeah, but they didn't grow up and kill them. Not every single not one every single did. One so did. There, there has to be something better. And exactly. this person did not rise to the occasion. Again, in this case, it worked. Yeah. Mitigation yeah. Uh, saved his life. Did save his life. All right, let's go on the other side of not mitigation here. Let's go to a clip of uh, one of the officer's friends on the stand. All I can think of is what a really, really great, nice guy the officer Sean Bolton was. Um, let's go to his brother now. Now this brother of the victim has really humanized the victim. What does that do for the sentencing of Wilburn? You know, we talk about aggravating, mitigating circumstances. As I, if they're just I, black I, and white. I tend to boil it down more like what aggravating factors, in fact, make you like the victim more. Right. And what mitigating factors make you hate the defendant less. Uh, because that's, you know, those are the emotions we're talking right, about here. Right. Oh, they're aggravating. They're mitigating. I mean, they, it gets all jumbled. That's what it, I mean, the emotion yes, is what area, the, yeah. the attorneys and the witnesses are working with here. And when it goes back to the jury room, they let that emotion out and it results in, you know, the decision. And in mm -hmm. this case, uh, aggravating factors lost out to the mitigating factors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But here, I mean, you can also see that, you know, the defendant, the, I mean, the victim here had a, he had a Yeah, not an easy childhood. Himself. Divorce is tough. Every kid old enough to understand what a divorce right. means thinks they are the, 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 at fault. Right, You know, right. they caused the parents to split up. That's a tough thing. Uh, okay, well, on a subject of not tough things, on a subject of good things, today is election day, so everybody go out and vote. Um, and tomorrow at 9 o'clock, tune in right here. There you go. We have special election covered, coverage. At ho we're hosting it tomorrow at 9 a.m. Our own Jesse Weber, we love our Jesse Weber, will be hosting and analyzing all the legal issues, yes, all the legal issues surrounding today's election. So join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. because Jesse's going to be hosting, but he's going to have a panel of legal experts coming in from all over the place, who knows where, um, but it's going to be fabulous. And we're going to be hosting and talking about all the legal issues that are surrounding what happens today from all of the districts around the country, things that arise from our election that's happening right today, going on right now in your precinct. So show up here tomorrow, 9 a.m., hosted by our own Jesse Weber. Oh, you know, I'll be here. I'll be watching. Hope you will be, too. Let's close out our time with you guys with a closing argument in the Brian, in the Wilburn case. Uh, prosecution. Let's close it out with that. All right. The, Michael, the, the prosecution's not going through these aggravating uh, just as an exercise. Of course not. No. You know, they want the death penalty. They want the death penalty. So they didn't get it. No, they didn't. This is kind of like kissing your sister, I have mm -hmm. to imagine, for the prosecution. They didn't get the death penalty, but they didn't totally lose with what would have been just life with the possibility of parole. Right. They got life without parole. So not a win for them. Yeah, you know, really. it, it's all it's all a matter of degree. Right, and they, as they were able to say in their presser, they let the jury decide. Of course. Now you're going to let our viewers decide because you're going to stick around with one handsome guy that's sitting right behind here, Aaron Keller, for the Daily Debrief. That's right, coming up.
Uh, so I'm very, and thank you for staying, staying with me oh, for the last two my hours. My pleasure, always I fun. Very, very much appreciate it. And Kelly Fry was our, our, our moment, yes. <laughs> Kelly this, Fry. The scientific uh, uh, We'll always have standard. Kelly Fry. We'll always have Kelly Fry. And we will always have tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We are hosting here a special tomorrow, 9 o'clock, with our own Jesse Weber. He's going to take us through the legal issues surrounding today's election. That's going to be amazing. I can't wait to be here, all of you. I hope you stay tuned with us tomorrow at 9 o'clock with Jesse Weber for our special on the election. I hope you all go out there and vote today. We've had an amazing day here today with long crime. We've covered the Wilburn trial. We've covered the Wilburn sentencing. We've covered the Kean. Uh, we've covered the Kean case as well. And that uh, verdict that came in today was a very uh, impactful um, to two hours. And so thank you so much for sharing it with me. Thank you, Michael Bryant, for being here and sticking around. And I'm Lise Wheel signing off for today. I will be with you um, next Tuesday. And I, until then, have a great week, and I'll see you on the other side.